Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this Master Investor Small Cap Chat, an hour of intelligence and insight. Now then, Donald Trump is threatening to launch a new social media platform called Truth Social. Meanwhile, William Shatner has just come down to Earth after his complimentary trip to outer space. He's now being hired as a cameo delivery driver for Amazon, pushing up prices, no doubt. So inflationary pressures, potential Bank of England interest rate rises, and what should investors believe? Our panel, of course, master investors Mark Watson, Mitchell and Stuart Fieldhouse of the Armchair Trader. Gentlemen, it is life, but not as we know it. And of course, it is half term here in the UK. And this is when the petrol at the pump tends to go to sky high. So news today, prices at the pump predicted to reach reach record highs within days. So let's start off, Stuart, with one of your picks, Marshall Motor Holdings, used and new car sellers. Um, yes, um, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Um, so a little bit of background on Marshall Motor Group. Um, we were looking, we've been looking at the, uh, actually the sort of German Scandinavian um, car dealership market. And we saw um, some of the share prices for some of the players in that market really picking up over the course of this year. And we, we saw that it was because of the second hand car sales rather than new car sales. And this was being driven by the disruption in the supply chains globally, which everyone's probably already now quite familiar with. Um, and looking at the UK market um, in, in small caps, we saw Marshall Motor Group has actually been doing very, very well recently. That the, the, sh the shares had broken out of a, a pretty tight trading range. They were in about the sort of 120 to 130 area. And then all of a sudden, you know, off, off they went from about 145 up to 260. Um, and, and it has really been two things that have been driving that. And, and one of them is the anticipation amongst investors that, that prices in secondhand cars are going up because we're suddenly moving from a situation where there was, I mean, if you think back to 2008, 2009, when, when um, car manufacturers could almost not give new cars away, We've shifted in the UK to a situation where there is just not as much supply for, for new cars and there's now actually a premium on, on decent second-hand cars. So you take someone like um, Motorline, they are firstly in that space. I think investors think that that's going to be a much more profitable space than previously. Secondly, they're also in expansion mode. And so they have been making more acquisitions of dealerships across the country. Um, their center of gravity tends to be in, in areas like Kent, West Sussex, Berkshire, places like that. But, but they seem to be adding to the portfolio of um, existing dealerships and also existing brands that they're, that they're already working with. So I think those two factors, the, the sort of secondhand premium story and the expansion story, just seem to be to be pushing pushing the share price, and then and then also supporting a lot of these sort of stories is the the fact that um, things have opened up. People are now looking at making new purchases like cars um, because they're you know people are starting to commute to work again and so forth. So all those combined um, has have actually pushed that that stock to to some new levels. Um, um, and also, you know, the numbers look good, um, you know, net profits up at uh, 39 million pounds. Um, forecast profits are looking pretty punchy as well. So overall, you know, the story for this one um, looks very positive indeed. So it makes you feel all sort of warm and cuddly because Marshalls has just bought Motorline, which you've mentioned. It's a, it's a very familial type group. I mean, Motor, Motorline, we found out, is family owned and it uh, joins a group being ranked the 12th best place to work in the UK. So who would have thought that, you know, used and new car sale dealerships 
are becoming part of the family, whereas they were so derided in the past. I mean, Mark, what is it that you've got on uh, your drive at the moment? I've got a 21 year old VW, which apparently is now worth a fortune. Well, I bought my BMW 630 automatic from a Chinese student just going back from Colchester University. And that was in 2012. And I bought it, I think, at a good price. It's probably worth a couple of thousand now. Very good. A good <laughs> <Who knows? laughs> a very good investment. Right. So this is when we stop talking about stocks yeah, and we uh, start talking about how much our a respective cars are worth, but it is half term, which brings me to one of your uh, picks, uh, Mark, the Brighton Peer Group. It's yeah. trading just off its year high, yep. owner of Lightwater Valley, where I've been once. So yeah, they're still talking about it. Yeah. yeah. The time you went. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it was a horrible experience because I'm oh, scared, dear. scared of heights. But you know, we are out of one lockdown before we're put into another. But um, how's Brighton Peer Group doing? Well, in fact, um, you say about Lightwater, they only bought that in June, and I think it was a cracking purchase. The timing of it was absolutely excellent because they did it just before the lockdowns ended, and Lightwater. A lot of space up in uh, Yorkshire, and it's, well, I think, about 170 acres. And it's got Europe's largest, longest roller coaster. There you are, a claim to fame up there. But Brighton Pier, lovely business. I think it's massively undervalued. Uh, it's 20 odd percent owned by Luke Johnson, who I've known for a long, long time. Um, back years, 90s. Um, Brighton Pier owns and operates the Brighton Palace Pier, and which has probably about 18 uh, entertainment arcades and rides and the like. And it also has got nine premium bars, night bars, you know, drinking bars, and in, under the Eclectic name. And Eclectic was in fact the name of the company that Luke Johnson took and put in Brighton Pier into. Um, they've also got eight mini golf centers and that they're actually indoors and they are very good. They're in, um, they're in shopping centers and the like. I love this business. I think it's massively undervalued. It's peers inside the leisure sector, leisure groups. They're probably on twice the rating that Brighton Pier is on. Uh, if I just whistle through the figures, it's a market cap of 26 million pounds, which is peanuts, uh, but I think very, very usable for Luke Johnson and his board, because I think they have very much expansion in mind. Um, the highest they've been is 74.75, which was just a fraction below my target price that I set in June, when I recommended the, sorry, profile the shares at 61p with a target of 75p, they'll be up there. I think they're going up to 90p, uh, so, and that offers about a 31% upside. Um, the figures are coming out shortly for June 2021, and they're going to be showing uh, revenues, I think, of about 8 million lower than 2020 at 16 million pounds. and. Um, but going into next year or into the current year, they're going to see about 37 million. Uh, and their EBITDA on that could be 10 million pounds. And considering it's 26 million pound market cap, you know, this is value. Um, much more interesting, the earnings per share are estimated to be 11.9 pence. But, and they're currently uh, 68 and a half. They're giving money away here. Uh, I think this is. I think this is going a lot higher. It's brilliant. I think it's a very nice business. They are just turning the money over. And I love. I love cash generators. It sounds to me as though you're a consumer of these uh, mini golf places. I bet you're a right bandit. I bet you really fib about your handicap. Do you think so? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but the thing is, I am a little bit wor worried. So yes, 26 million pounds a year right, yeah. is, is peanuts. I'm a bit worried though, because if we do go into another lockdown, who's going to be playing mini golf? It'll just be you with your solo bandit handicap. Yeah. Um, it benefited from, you know, that temporarily reduced rate of VAT, it got rate relief in terms of government support. But what happens if it's Groundhog Day and we do go back into lockdown and have to stay at home? Sorry, you sound like my wife. Uh, total, total pessimist. Uh, listen, I, you, you have to take a view. You have to be optimistic. I mean, if you, if you think, oh, my God, I'm going to go outside of the front door today and I'm going to be hit, hit by a car, don't do it. Just the whole stock market is about opportunity. I'm giving you some opportunity here. The Brighton Peer Group at 68.5p with a possible 11.9 pence of earnings. To me, that's cheap. Yeah. But, and yes, it could go belly, belly flopping on a lockdown. I know what you were going to say there. Um, <laughs> Very close. Yeah. So, um, as I was saying, it is, well, it's currently half term in Scotland. They're coming to the end of their two weeks. Um, so if you were unfortunate enough to book flights to Morocco, that's awful because as of midnight last night, uh, Morocco doesn't want anybody visiting from uh, the UK and other places. So should we go to... Vietnam. Now, this is one of uh, Stuart's picks, Vietnam Holding. Um, it has been an extraordinary year for Vietnam's benchmark stock index. It's gained 23% since the start of 2021. Why should we be interested in Vietnam Holding, Stuart? Uh, well, I, a couple of reasons, really, but... Um... The, I mean, Vietnam Holding is basically, a, it's an investment trust. Um, I think it's got uh, around about 90 million sterling assets under management, um, trading still at about 11% discount. Um, Vietnam, a couple of things to say about it. Firstly, um, go, some time ago, I used to work with the guys who were going to put together um, one of the first ETFs trading the Vietnam market. It was a Vietnam single country ETF. And the, one of the obstacles, I'm not going to say who these guys were, and the project never got off the ground, but the, one of the obstacles they had was that ETF. The, the, the investor enthusiasm was so great for it that the, this bank would have ended up holding close to half of, at that stage, the Vietnamese stock market. So it was thought that wouldn't be. Um, since then, the Vietnamese market has expanded in just in terms of the market cap and the liquidity and you can get something like this fund running at 90 million and it's not going to make a big impact but the the thing to bear in mind about vietnam is it, it it's actually done very well if you look at southeast asian economies it's done very well yeah i mean it's done better than a lot of the other countries out there like indonesia during the pandemic um, it was a first mover when the pandemic started to bring in um, restrictions early on. And, and um, as a consequence, the impact there was was not as great as it was elsewhere. Um, and you've seen that in the performance of the stock market there, which has been just one of the best performing stock markets, if not the best in the whole Asia Pacific region already. Um, and the second thing to bear in mind is there's a lot of money coming out of China at the moment. Um, a lot of people selling out for one reason or another. There's a lot of political risk. People have lost money on Alibaba. Um, and Vietnam is, is a big populous economy. It's still relatively cheap for companies to, to look at setting up shop there. I think it's going to be a direct beneficiary of any further fallout from China over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, but the thing, the thing I really wanted to mention specifically about Vietnam Holding is that, that that particular investment trust, you've already got an extremely um, high performing market. I think it, we're looking at uh, up over 23% this year. Vietnam Holding has beaten that because that's its, the, the Vietnamese stock market benchmark It's beaten that by another 24%. It's advised by a local fund manager called Dynam Capital. 
and um, they've been very bullish in areas like financial services sector in, in Vietnam. They've been, they've been um, pretty overweight in that. Um, but the interesting thing that, that, that they've been saying is that what they, what they saw in 2020 during the pandemic was a lot of the big foreign investors in Vietnamese stocks actually backed out of the country because there was just generally at that stage a little bit of a, um, a flight out of higher risk assets and a lot of people were going to cash. But at the same time, they, they've noticed a ch slight change in the dynamic because a lot of retail investors in Vietnam are now in the market. Um, and that's also been another driver of, of prices there. Um, so, I mean, it's been, doing, it's been doing really well so far, but I think and it's got a three star rating from Morningstar. But I, I think so, a lot of the fundamentals underpinning the Vietnamese um, economic story are not going to go away and you're going to see that foreign money coming back into the market now um, over the next 12 months um, i'm confident even if you know we've spoken already on this webinar about what happens if you know there's another wave of the pandemic or there's another mutation vietnam's already proved you know to the world that that it can manage the pandemic very well and, and stop it from getting out of hand so um you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm just very confident in this. And I think for a lot of people who are shopping around for an Asia single country play right now, um, because they, you know, they, they, they're out of China looking too risky. I think this one is, is, is looking like, um, oh yeah. And I mean, the other, the other great is just the numbers you get from, from these guys, even if you look at it over, sort of uh three years or even 10 years i mean this this one is up something like over 600 percent over a 10-year time frame so this is not just a you know flash in the pan which is going to go away next year it's a very competent fund management team that really really understands this market if they're able to put together numbers like that over that kind of a time period and they are so communicative. I mean, I've been looking at their RNS releases. It's almost on a daily basis in terms of um, how often they alert shareholders to the net asset value of their fund. And um, yes, so Mark, in terms of companies you've chosen who are highly loquacious, who are not backwards and coming forwards in terms of giving shareholders uh, regular updates. I'm looking at um, one of those that perhaps isn't as chatty as the rest, but a very interesting business regardless, and that is Braemar Shipping oh, Services. They've lovely got, business. So they've got a new management team as well. So yeah. how lovely. Last couple of years. Yeah, that's right. It's, I think, hey, they are in absolutely the right sector. I mean, the shipping sector is has it's been phenomenal this year, absolutely phenomenal. And you look at the prices of the containers. I can't remember the exact figures, but they've gone up from sixteen hundred to sixteen thousand or whatever it was uh, in the price this year. Uh, not that that's directly relative to Braemar, but Braemar has been concentrating with this new management team on really pushing its shipbroking side. Now they, they handle a whole range of uh, integrated marine services, but it's a lovely, lovely business. It's valued at about 84 million pounds. Um, the shares are 258p. I think that they will make um, probably uh, in the year to end February next year, about 11, 11 and a half million pounds. So 84 million, 11 and a half million, uh, very good figures. Uh, and then I'm looking for 24 pence of earnings, that's current year, going next <coughs> year, 27 pence of earnings on probably 12 and a half to 13 million of uh, pre-tax profits. And they've also uh, got uh, a tremendous discount to the peer in the group, which is Clarkson. Clarkson's on about 28 times. This one is on 11 times its earnings. That's cheap. Uh, um, even if they rise to 15 times, hey, that's still a massive upside. I think there's a 50% upside in this share price. 
Um, FinCap, who are the brokers to the company, uh, they actually have a target price of 444 pence compared to 258 today. Yeah, I like that. Um, they've been as high as 323. Um, I've been very lucky with having profiled it at 185p with a target price of 250. Then again, uh, after the COVID hassles last year, I did another profile at 99 pence, targeting 150. Uh, I see these. I see these 300, 350. Easy peasy. Chicken and squeezy, as they say. <laughs> and it's, it Four. sounds as though it's another company that's familial. You know, we talked about how familial the Marshall Motor Holdings was and how it acquired family owned businesses, but with Braemar, it looks as though they are very generous in the amount of advice that they give their clients. So whilst they might not be as frenzied with their RNS releases, apparently internally, they are second to none in terms of looking after those who pay the bills, essentially. Well, of course, it's business, it's business. I mean, if you're already uh, a shipping operator and you suddenly see the opportunity of a, another another addition to your fleet, you can go to them and they will help you to find it. They help you to buy it at the right price, help you to fund it, and then help you to maintain it and get you good business. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's a lovely, lovely business. I like, I like the way that you describe them, but closer to my heart, gentlemen, is uh, a good, Screeder. Um, I am a, a qualified plasterer. Oh, um, hey, that's what I've always wanted to do. <laughs> it. I'm not joking. Uh, if I have my time again, this age old thing, there are five things that I want to do. I want to become lawyer, an accountant, um, a plasterer, a London taxi driver, and a charity worker. So there you go. Well, you certainly have. The knowledge you don't need um, to become a London taxi driver to share that innate intelligence but um, I can tell you that being a plasterer it's very um, it's very painful in your ball and socket oh, joint right. um, oh. but screeding um, but is that only one arm though I am right-handed yes oh, right okay so the, the left great, you've got to be happy with it the left handers of this world apparently are geniuses but prone to hypochondria so i think <laughs> so, so samaro samaro enterprises Stuart. it oh, sounds lovely. as though it lovely saves business. the um the, the ball and socket joints it's um it's, it's got initiatives where screeding and concrete it's a leveler up. sorry <laughs> it's a leveler love it's, it yeah. you be quiet <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I, I have to hold up my hand and say I'm a left-hander, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but um, yes, no, screeding, I mean, Sumero, I mean, we, we kind of started looking at it just from the metrics, but then then we sort of looked at it a little bit in, in more depth and, and we've done our homework on what, what screeding is, because I'm not a, I'm not myself a um, qualified plasterer, but uh, the concrete yeah concrete screeding um for those who who aren't familiar with it is, is an important part of the construction process where you in this case you're using specialist equipment um laser-based equipment to um help build flatter smoother surfaces um in places like for example car parks warehouses but large scale anything sort of really large scale concrete construction um i should say that sumero enterprises is, is a primarily us focused um business and that's again one of the things that, that we liked about it because um it's really i mean the share price has done really well in the last sort of 12 months or so but the thing i think too you've got to really look ahead with this one um and some of the prospects that it might have um, ahead of it. It has been as high as 560p on the London market, has dropped back a little bit recently, but there are two things that we think um, it could really benefit from. One is the, the real um, 
boom in the construction of warehouses, particularly in North America, because there has been, you've had this massive um, uptick in the um, online shopping market. It's happening here in the UK as well, but it's happened in the US. And there haven't, and they've, there's ended up being a shortage of warehouse space. So I think looking short term, there is now a lot of premium on warehouse capacity and warehouse construction in the US. Um, these guys have a lot of customers who are involved in warehouse construction. Um, second thing is, as a lot of you know, there is a bill going through Congress, um, which um, has a lot of stimulus characteristics and is designed to pump potentially as much as a trillion dollars, possibly more into the infrastructure um, building sector or infrastructure construction in the US is going to be part of this. Um, so the US construction sector is going to see a lot more concrete construction. And again, Samero is well positioned to benefit from that. So I think that's why there are already quite a lot of investors in the stock. Um, the PE is still down at 12. So it's still looking cheap at the moment. Um, sales growth is at 82%. Um, so, I mean, the metrics look very good for this. Um, it is, um, I would say it's, um, you know, first half, first half um, revenue profile looks, looks very good at $64 million. That's up from 35 million first half 2020. Um, and it's a company that generates a lot of cash. It pays a decent dividend. Um, last year, it paid out um, 16.81 cents in regular dividends. Um, there was a supplementary dividend of 18.1 cents. Um, it has a dividend formula, um, which is based on a benchmark where um, year, if year end cash total surpasses $20 million, it will then distribute 50% of the excess as a dividend. So I know some, a lot of investors at the moment, um, given where the market is, are looking at um, stocks that are likely to be um, you know, good dividend payers going forward. And this, this certainly looks like one of those as well. Um, so um, it's also got quite a lot of cash on the books. So we're expecting that they'll be using some of that to reinvest in um, new projects, including um, potentially new technology as well. So um, definitely, definitely want to watch if, if we get the anticipated construction boom in the US. And there you go, storage, 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 which brings me back to Mark's pick of Braemar shipping services, because um, in the in the previous year, I understand that um, there was a huge demand for storage capacity and Braemar shipping services were a beneficiary of this demand for storage. Uh, earlier on in the year, when remember when the price of oil um, suddenly fell to absolutely nothing? Do you remember that earlier on this year? And it was stupid, it was a stupid price because everybody was trying desperately to store it because they were not prepared to sell it at the wrong price. So they were, they were literally um, hiring ships across the world to keep oil in it, um, waiting for a better price. And that's what Braemar happened to do well with uh, at the time that containers and the ships uh, were doing fantastic business. Yeah. So yes, it is a, I love Braemar. It's, it's, it's a cracking stock. Well, Braemar is sounding like your favourite child because I was going to stick Oh, with... no, I've got a lot of them. <laughs> I have a lot of them. I've done 250 companies on Master Investor and I, I'm a, I, I look for value as much as possible. I, I'm, I find it hard to, to profile a speculative situation. I have a few, but I find it hard to profile a speculative situation because the market can be such a wicked mistress. It can it can be really rising and going extremely well, and then suddenly you get your what's it's taken down, and and that's what happens. Uh, you know, see the way the FTSE index is performing currently, and you think, 
oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. But in fact, and it just suddenly falls below 7,000, and then within days it's back up to 7,250. You know, it's Go keeping, for value. Go it, for value. <laughs> it's keeping you on your toes, but you say that the market is a wicked mistress because yes. um, let's stick with building products. Let me talk oh. about Al Alamask Group. Yes. Now, the market cap today was today is 77 million. However, it was higher yesterday until today's RNS. There you go, the market being a wicked mistress and um so they've they've brought out some some news today, and I don't know whether it's profit taking or just mis. No, it's an AGM statement, and they are very sensible, very cautious. They're saying they've got supply chain hassles, like everybody has. Um, they their their people, their their clients are a lot of them are just finding uh, business a bit tough, waiting for decisions, waiting for planning permissions, but. Alimast is still going, going, going. I think it's a cracker. Actually, I think the market cap is about 82 million. Um, the shares have been as high as 288 uh, this year, in the last year. Um, I love this business. I, I recommend, sorry, profiled it in February last year at 116p, and again in June last year at 80p, and both times they, they hit my target price. Uh, Brokers' target prices currently are around 315 pence for the shares. And um, I'm looking for the company, the figures um, to, to make about um, 90, sorry, 97 million revenues this year in the, the year to end June 2022, and about 10.8, 11 million of profit. That's earnings. 23 and a half, 24 pence a share, and the shares are 224 currently. I mean, this is the wrong price. You know, that's the repairs and maintenance and impro imp improvisation, sorry, improvement uh, sector is a great big driver. I think there's a 40% upside in these shares. Uh, it's a, it has a, a range of premium products that it sells uh, to uh, its customers. And, um, the house building boom, it's, it's going to continue. There is a desperate, desperate need for new houses. So they, they will be, I mean, they do everything from uh, building products for uh, roofs right down to the drains. And it's, it has a whole range. I love it. Mark, I'm going to sound like your, your wife again, because oh, I'm, yeah. yes, I'm allowed. I'm your online, uh, your work wife. For this Ooh. next half hour or so but oh, yes only half an hour <laughs> <laughs> that's all it takes housing fundamentals are strong however supply chain yes. constraints oh they're terrible they are you know, if they can't get the stuff through but they've got the orders and they're improving their orders and they actually are very confident apart from these outside factors they are very confident of their ongoing business love it <laughs> you are such a gem let's go on to next Stuart's next gem gem yeah. and uh, staying with the uh, construction now over the past year the share price of Galliford Tri has been a thing of great beauty um nice current market cap 213 million pounds Stuart so what is it about this company and the chief executive who's only been in place for about a year. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think it's um, there are two things at work with with Gallifer Tri. Um, I think as a construction business and they can shoot me for saying this. I mean, if you think about the UK construction sector um, and, and you think about when we were in the depths of the pandemic, one of the first sectors that, that the government basically said you guys can go back to work was construction. And so you would expect that for many companies, it was it, it was not quite business as usual, but, but a lot of building sites, a lot of big construction projects, they were only shut down for a short period of time and then they were back up and running. Um, I think with Gallifer Try, I mean, we, we, we like what the share price has been doing. 
Uh, they just seem to have been hit harder by the pandemic than many of their peers. And what we're seeing now is the management team refocusing the business um, and um, reassuring the investor community that they're going to be taking a little bit more of a um, low risk strategy. I think as a consequence of that, people are going back into the stock because it is a very strong post pandemic UK construction recovery play. So that I think is why you, you've seen the share price, um, which was actually around about 125 pence uh, in late June. Um, last time I looked, it was at about 190. Um, and it, it's a strong momentum play. Um, as you say, 211 million sterling market cap. Um, it's uh, the, the last set of four year results um, show the company back into profit. Um, and that's versus a loss of over 62 million pounds the year before. So it really has, it has really reversed its fortunes. Um, I think the other thing that, that people have been looking at is the balance sheet. Um, companies now much more cash rich because it sold um, Linden Homes to Bovis in January 2020, um, which I think you know investors just like to see to see a little bit more of a bit more cash on the balance sheet than was there before. Um, I think it's got something like three brokers currently following it, and they all rate it as um, a very strong buy. Um, it's of all you know of the companies I've been talking about previously. I'm not as bullish on this one. Um, it's We've looked at a number of UK construction companies, um, which we've written about on the website in the last three months. So there's definitely a strong recovery theme across the sector and investors who are in that space right now will have been seeing the benefit from that. You're seeing companies, the right, the right companies in this space, um, including those that are focused on um, the sort of affordable housing market, residential market, um, have been doing well. Um, I think with something like Gallifrey Tri as well, they've got some exposure in um, the infrastructure space and um, they may not have said this themselves, but this is just my view, is I'm anticipating a lot more money coming into infrastructure around um, um, sort of green projects, including energy projects and things like that. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see a company like this starting to pick up a few mandates in that space as well. Um, I, I don't think people fully appreciate just how much money is going to be spent um, in what um, Gallifrey Tri calls environment businesses. Um, but I think that's a sector that if, if, if the company gets the right projects in that space, um, they should be they should be able to do very well. Um, I guess in terms of risk factors, if there was one, um, and it, it, we keep coming back to the same thing, if there's another lockdown, how well are they going to do? They should they should be fine because they're a construction company. Um, the industry's been through a couple already. You'd like to think that they now have a roadmap on how they're going to cope with this. So so I like you know that what whereas that is a, a risk factor i think they should be they should be okay if that happens um but overall i mean we've, we've profiled a number of construction companies on the site again this is another one where where we think you know it's a good story um it's a good new management team um uh, the, the market likes it as well you can see that from the way the share price has been behaving so um we, we have great expectations from this one over the next six to 12 months. And how wonderful that you have three brokers all sort of in alignment as well. Now that's kind of unusual because they do compete against each other. So that is an unusual element to the story. But I, I like what you said there about the the risk factor roadmap because uh, one of Mark's companies has been treading that very fine line for quite some time as we we go from print to more online and that's um, Smith's News. Now that company has a new chief financial officer but um, Paul Baker may be rude to comment at this stage Mark because he's only been in the job for a fortnight. <laughs> 
Well, I again, this is another value situation. I just think it's a cracker. Ninety-five million pound market cap, likely to make twenty-seven and a half million pre-tax profits. <laughs> this is like giving money away. But better still, better still, uh, earnings per share of nine pence. The shares are currently thirty-eight pence, and it's likely to give a two point three pence per share dividend. So that gives a six six percent yield. I mean. We know that it's definitely going to have that money turning over. It has a mega turnover uh, of one one billion, one point one billion uh, turnover. I think this is brilliant. It's the largest newspaper and magazine distributor in the UK. It has fifty five percent of the market. Menzies has the other. They've nicely divided it. They have long term contracts with their newspaper publishers, the magazine publishers, and they supply supermarkets and uh, independent retailers, 24,000 retailers across the country. I mean, it's a lovely little business. Um, okay, yes, it's got big debt, but it's driving the debt down, no problem. Um, the figures for 2021, uh, so August revenue, uh, August end uh, 2021, should be about 1.1 billion of revenue, 27.7 million of profits, nine pence of earnings, 1.6 pence of dividend, and that gives the shares a historic 4.3% yield. The yield is almost going to be higher than the PE. I mean, you don't get that very often. Um, they've been up to 47 and a half pence. I've currently got, a, I think, a, a 55p uh, target price out on them. I think they could actually be 70, 75 pence. It's, you know, to me, it's like giving money away. Um, where, <laughs> so. where is all this money going to? You keep saying it's like giving money away. Um, yeah. They're not giving too much away, though, because you are quite right. That debt is being paid down, and yes, um, Ed Edison yeah. Research have made a really big thing about about this, and it's a tremendous achievement, particularly when we've stopped using um, newspapers to wrap our fish and chips in. Yes, this is true, but now, yes, the the online world is really suddenly expanding. Well, suddenly, in the last two or three years, it's really expanded on the media side. Another one of my favorites is a little company called National World. And they're the people that took over the old Johnson Press, uh, uh, provincial newspapers. And, and they are literally taking every one of those companies, uh, every one of those uh, publications and turning them into online operations and then monetizing. Them. But anyway, that's something else in time. Smith's News, lovely business, no problem, no hassle. Cheap. Yeah, and thank you for drawing our attention to National World, uh, particularly as I am a provincial newspaper graduate. So, um, oh, yeah, very good. I think they've got one, the Hartlepool Mail where I started. Right. Off. But you talk about them, you mentioned the word expansive there. Now, one of the most expansive bulletin boards is devoted to um, IOG, yeah. Mark. You know, I'm looking at the bulletin boards because they, um, they're, they're, some of them are pretty good, but this one, this particular bulletin board is so noisy that it makes my eyeballs bleed. Um, however, with the winter energy crisis just around the corner, um, why is this your speculative play? Oh, totally speculative. I mean, this is not for widows and orphans. This is, um, I think, just a, a cracking little situation. 30 pence a share. They are 158 million market cap. The profits last year were terrible. It was a loss, 6.8 million. This year to uh, December, the estimates are 3.6 million profit. Next year, 64.9 million. Okay, market cap 158 million. Profit, 64.9 million. To me, cheap. Okay, they 
and they are selling their gas, they should be showing their first gas coming from the Blythe and Elgood um, fields in the southern North Sea. They should be coming through. I think it's going to be sometime uh, this month or in the next three or four weeks. Just, just a gut feel, just a gut feel, but certainly within this quarter. And I think that this is, uh, it's going to be 48, 50p. It could be 90 pence. You know, it has that type of feel. If you're looking at 65 million of uh, profits, you're looking at 10 pence of earnings. And what are they? The 30 pence. Again, I'm sorry, I get excited. I'm, uh, I, you know, it's, I think it's cheap. Okay, Stuart. So but speculative. I, but speculative, Stuart. IOG um, must be on your radar as well. I mean, it's been described by some retail investors as the white knight in terms of the energy crisis we find ourselves in. Yeah, I mean, it's um, the. Uh, I mean, the gas story. I think is 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 that one's going to run and run um, over the winter months. Um, if you've got. Um, that kind of size company that has potential um, in, in, in the gas area, then it's definitely um, going to be one you have to watch watch closely. But we've been, I mean, we've, we've been following the, um, the gas price. Um, it's it's on our commodities side. Um, we, we called it as the commodities momentum trade of the year about, I think it was four months ago. Um, and you could see that that was already starting to build in the summer. And then you've had a lot of factors coming in to push gas prices up, like the, um, for example, the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. Nobody's too sure what the Russians are up to. Um, they say they're going to pump more gas. Do we believe them? So if you've got, if you look at somewhere like the UK, if you've got some, you know, someone like IOG, um, position to bring on more more supply and that's going to be yeah you know, they write their own check Stuart is there going to be illustrated books this Christmas well so yeah this is my this is my like speculative one um so again you know not not for the faint-hearted um it's it, quarto group um is it's a London, it's, it's quite an unusual company. It's a London listed um, publisher of primarily um, hardback illustrated books. And, and people who are looking at this um, video feed now will see that I'm quite, quite a fan of books generally. Um, even though we do live in a digital age, yes, I use a Kindle, but at the end of the day, and I don't know what it is, I just still think that there's going to be a market for, for actual physical books. Um, maybe I'm just a refugee from the 20th century, but um, a quarter group, it's London listed, um, it's, um, but it primarily sells in the US market. Um, it's it's a micro cap play, um, but it is um, you know, the total enterprise value is about fifty six million. Revenues are just under about a hundred million, but we've seen the shares doing quite well this year. It jumped from seventy four p to hit one hundred and five over the summer. Um, it's it's kind of fallen a little bit into a into a tight sort of trading range um, around about sort of 95 to 100 but um it is a small company there isn't a huge amount of activity in the shares so it's not something you're going to be able to move a lot of money into or out of um part of the reason the share price has been picking up is because the ceo um who also owns um printing uh, he's involved in a printing company in in hong kong has been um, that company is um, called 1010 Printing, and that company's been building, increasing its stake in Quarter Group, um, and I think has now 37%. Uh, um, the CEO, Chuck Kin Lau, um, I think personally owns something around the region of 4%. So he is um, increasing his own stake in the business. Um, it currently employs something like 300 people. And it's been around for a while because it was founded in um, 1976. 
Um, uh, it, like, like so many of the stories that we've been talking about today, it's again another situation where um, the company didn't do well during the pandemic. Um, it is, has been facing supply chain disruption. Um, and, and the CEO himself has, has said that, um, you know, he can see the trading environment will remain um, challenging, particularly with volatility in freight prices and, and capacity issues. But um, he says that he's got what he calls uh, the right plans in place to capture all possible opportunities and ensure a satisfactory year end. It certainly seems that he's got a small loyal base of investors who are, who are willing to buy into that. Um, so, you know, the, the, that, that said, you know, I think this is possibly not a long-term play. I, you know, caveat emptor, long-term, I've worked in the book publishing industry myself. Um, you look at the dynamics of this stock, it's not gonna be one that you, in my, my personal opinion, it's gonna be interesting to see how they can, they can maintain revenues at a time when they're gonna to have to compete against um, um, digital. I, I think there's still a story there because I think there's still demand for, for hard copy books like this. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think he's going to keep buying more stock into in, in quarter groups. So that's potentially going to drive the price as well. But this is a speculative one. Um, this is not like the other ones I've discussed already. Um, this is higher risk and, and it's more for your, you know, um, not for your rainy day money, basically. But maybe for your Christmas stocking, because when I prefaced that, I said, you know, will there be illustrated books for Christmas? Because they have highlighted freight as an issue. Um, so we, it brings us back to Braemar Shipping Services. There you go. We keep coming back. I know, it's a good to, business uh, to come back to. It's because you look like a mariner. That's what it is. You think so? Yeah. Got the guarantee going, I guess. <laughs> Definitely, definitely, but I do, you know, perhaps they should have an illustrated book of um, your puppy who just made a little... Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, my 12-year-old tart. That is Digby, Cocker Spaniel. Sorry, he just... Well, he's, been, Dig... he's been sitting literally by the side wondering who the hell I'm talking to. So the... <laughs> I think Digby was getting jealous. But, gentlemen, we have had um, a question. So you've, you've um, been very generous, but if you were to pick one stock out of your offerings today. So Stuart, which is the share that you, I know you've got the speculative play, but which one are you most comfortable with? Not necessarily confident about, but comfortable with. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna go with Sumero Enterprises. Um, I think US construction I personally believe U.S. construction is going to be in, in, in a very bullish place. Um, I also think that, you know, regardless of where the market goes, um, companies like that, if, if there is so much stimulus money coming into that sector, they're just going to be making money anyway. Um, it, it's not. It depends who you talk to about it. Um, but I was talking to an American guy yesterday. He was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that. If, if, if it will be just such a sort of generation defining boost to the sector as you say but out of the ones I've discussed today I think Samaro you know if I had to pick one it would be that one. I'm going to ask Mark the same question however he's already told us that he doesn't have any favourites but I'm going to put no. you on the spot I want you to choose one. Well I, actually I, I have to say I'm talking about today Alumask after the AGM statement, which was cautious and sensibly so, the shares are down 14 pence, down 6% today. I think there's a buying opportunity there, especially as I'm, as I'm going for 315 pence. Um, I, I, they, it, the company has continually performed for me uh, since I profiled it in February of last year and then again in, in June of last year. Um, and it's and it's been up to 280, I think, 280, 88. 224 pence. I think this is a good, a good risk. Uh, yield, 4, 4% yield, 4.2% yield, uh, 10 pence earnings this year. Ah, it's, it's lovely. They are easy. Uh, and 
good buying opportunity today. In fact, once you're talking, the, the volume, daily volume is in fact 50% up on average daily currently. So just under 100,000 shares traded on uh, 62,000 average per day. Since you started talking about them. But Mark, in terms of the trading themes that we've highlighted today, the ones I've picked up are simplicity, infrastructure, good yes. management, and yeah, shipping, ship storage. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, what about a gas? We're full of it. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> in terms of the trading themes, because you were a bit ticked off with me because you thought that I was going, I was getting all COVID pessimistic. I do see that as a um, as a trading theme, but what what do you think investors should be thinking of, be mindful of in in the last few months of this year? Okay, we've had a lovely period of trading in the UK stock market since March of last year when all hell broke loose and everybody was, you know, crying, 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 disaster, disaster, disaster. Um, that's when we did a master investor uh, market recovery portfolio and it's up 110, 15% since then um, on 10 stocks. It's a fair, fair average. And um, I think this market has been extremely good to us this year. The, the dealing volumes, I think, are, begin, are sh slowing, obviously, and a lot of the funds are seeing some substantial withdrawals uh, on the various of them. Um, I think that we've got the run up to Christmas and then early New Year with all the predictions of how the market is going to perform. I, I would rather be an investor today looking for value it's going higher. Thank you very much. Well, Stuart. Okay, that, that's my crystal ball. Thank you. Okay. Stuart, another trading theme is brokers in alignment. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to, um, was it Galliford Try that had three brokers that were in alignment? So what, what would you say to investors in terms of, you know, apart from, you know, put, popping their head above the parapet, as it were, for the last couple of months? I think... I think it, if you look at what's been happening in the market since you know, the, the post-pandemic rally, um, that's just been a huge macro theme that's really driven um, prices across the board. I think now we're getting to a point, and this is where I agree with Mark, you've got to really start <clears throat> being a little bit more selective. Um, I mean, if you I mean, we've talked a lot about the construction sector, for example, now it's almost like you could have just pick any UK construction stock and, and that would be up just because um, I think now you've got to have to start looking at some some um, you know, th there will be companies that are going to going to do well, um, but you've got to be just a very selective and you've got to look at where they are in terms of their price history now, because if anything that's looking really expensive, um, you know, if there's a reverse in the market um, that that's going to get hit. So so you have to start beginning to look at your portfolio and, and, and look at how stuff is priced at the moment and and that's why you know if you can see if you can th see things that are cheap they've got a story and they've got um a story that's going to carry on regardless and then go back to my point about u.s infrastructure spending um that's th those are going to be the more interesting stocks i think at the end of the day beautiful gentlemen that that takes us to the end of the session. Thank you very, very much indeed. Stuart Fieldhouse, the armchair uh, trader, ma our master investor, Mark Watson, Mitchell and Digby. And Thank Digby. You very, very, very much indeed. We love those cameo appearances. Um, and as just as we all wave you farewell, there are some events coming up the 17th of uh, November. We have investing in the age of longevity. Um, there's only a few spaces available for that, but um, I'm sure you'll see quite a few of us uh, there. Um, that's very interesting. And we're going to put up the details of how to get in touch with all of us if you are interested. So thank you very much. Take care. It has been a pleasure. Gentlemen. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.
let's do it again soon thank you thanks